I want to thank ONT for the opportunity to speak here. It's a great pleasure to be back. For those of you who are online, I can tell you it's raining out there, so uh, you're not missing an awful lot. You're missing an awful lot in here. The food is wonderful and the company is great. Um, I'm going to talk about a novel method for multiplexed full-length single molecule sequencing of human mitochondrial DNA using Cas9 mediated enrichment. Okay, if I can have my slides, please. Ah, I go with this? Ah, okay, good. Okay, that I just said. So, by way of introduction, uh, we've heard some things about mitochondrial DNA in the meeting so far. Uh, just to remind you, it is a, a very particular piece of DNA uh, that we have in our genome. It is, uh, it is circular. It is 16.6 .6 kb. Uh, it has 37 very important genes. It is represented multiple times in each cell, so not only as two copies, but sometimes hundreds, tissue dependent, and it is inherited maternally. We get it from our mother. Um, it does, is not packed like the rest of the genome, and it has no repair mechanism, so it accumulates somatic mutation as we get older, and uh, that can pose a certain problem. It is uh, genetically heterogeneous, uh, we end up with multiple representations, heteroplasmies, different concentrations of different variants of it inside uh, our system. And the variants can be single base changes or they can be structural variants. Uh, it interacts with about 250 nuclear genes, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very active. And it's involved in many, many diseases, particularly ones that, uh, that go with metabolism, energetics and so on. Very important piece of DNA. Okay, so there's a good reason why you want to analyze this very, very thoroughly and know exactly what you've got in your hands. And so one of the things we came up with was uh, the development of a method that we really completely can cover this molecule really, really nicely. And so what we did is we used Cas9 targeted uh, 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 procedures. So essentially what Cas9 is, it's a double strand, strand cutting enzyme you target to a given position with a guide RNA, you make a double strand break, and you have a, a specific position where you, can, where you can work from. And what we implemented is the following. We took this and we essentially uh, moved it into, into a system. And so what we do is we take genomic DNA. You can make molecules that are uh, linear refractive to the downstream sample preparation by dephosphorylating the end. So you can take everything that is that you don't want, you can sort of move out of the picture, you can even put uh, uh, an X of 5 digest on and take all of that DNA out of your reaction, reasonably easy to do. And then you can take the sample and cut it at a given position. And the way we do this is we cut at different positions in different samples, and this allows us to afterwards bring these together into a single reaction moving down. So we can, we can multiplex that way. So put multiple samples together, all of them defined by the place where we actually cut this mitochondrial DNA. There's another thing. Uh, Cas9 has a bad reputation in combination with nanopores because the Cas9 enzymes tends to stick on to the DNA and then block pores, not run nicely, not work perfectly. And so what we actually do is we dephosphorylate, no, we, we proteinase K digest the sample after we've actually opened them up. And then we pool them all together, put them through a single sample prep, stick them in the nanopore sequencer, and take the reads and, and base call them with guppy. Okay, this is what it looks like uh, when this is running through a sequencer. So you have a 16.6 kb fragment that you predominantly see in these runs. And you can do this using the, the R9.4, the 10.3, 10.4. You can use it with, with Q20 chemistry, even though it, it actually doesn't even matter that much which, which one of these tools you actually use. It works quite well on, on all of them. Okay, the next thing you have to do is you have to take all of the reads you have and put them back into their boxes. You de have to, have to demultiplex the system. And the way you do this is you essentially quickly align all of your reads to the genome and you figure out which ones actually belong to the mitochondrial sequences. So you take those reads over to one side. That's the, the first step. Um, here, I just show you the, uh, the, the start positions of 
such reads. So this, these are eight different uh, samples cut with eight different uh, guide RNAs, and you see these starts are really, really well defined through this uh, system. You can use the front and the end of a read to define the read, or you can use the front or the end only to define a read. So if you use the front and the end, you get obviously very, very nice even coverage because you've chosen molecules that are 16.6 kb and just run across the, the thing. If you want to give yourself more coverage, you can add the other reads on top of it as well. Now, the next step is you want to carry out variant calling. So you basically take your multiplex put them into separate files, into separate boxes, and align them up to this circular piece of DNA. Now, the issue is that you have, a, obviously, a, a linear sequence and a circular uh, sort of reference. And in order to avoid problems with, uh, with splitting reads, we just make a synthetic uh, template that is twice the length of the mitochondrial sequence and basically map each one of the, the, the boxes that we have to this particular box. Then um, there's a slight difference in what we're looking for. So in nuclear DNA, you in normal situation, you're looking for positions that are um, either reference, reference, reference alternative, or alternative, alternative in genotype, which means 50-50 um, representation of the two alleles that you might find. This obviously breaks down in mitochondrial DNA, where you are more in a context of, a, of somatic mutations. And um, what you do there is you essentially have to go down in frequency. You want to know what is very low frequency but really true, and you have to sort of measure down to that, which means you have to sort of come up with, a, with an error model and, and develop this error model and then make a, a, a prediction, a maximum likelihood a frequency estimate on that particular position to find out whether a, a varying call is actually true representative and what is the frequency of that. Um, we do this with very, very old, very, very robust statistics. We use a, a Fisher scoring method to maximize the likelihood and then get a prediction out of that. Now, that is how we do it uh, when we're looking at alternative alleles in the single nucleotide variant space. When you move to uh, insertions and deletions, or long or short, you have to slightly change the, the strategy. So you have to move away the full length reads, use those the way I just described before, and the, the shorter ones, the ones that are deleted, you have to define the breakpoints, bring it back into the system, and then predict the, uh, the, um, the alternative allele positions on that and count. So, once you're at that point, you can generate a nice varying call file. You feel this, feel, feel this, uh, you, you, you feed this varying co uh, call file into mitomap, genomat, mitotip, uh, assign haplotype groups, and do a haplocheck, and then get an annotated file. So it tells you whether you actually have a pathogenic variant, what is actually up uh, in the, the file you have. So this is the really complicated scheme uh, of the tools that we have put together to an analyze this. The two blue ones, the ONT demultiplex, is the system that is used to demultiplex the reads. And then Baldur on the left side, on the right side, is the tool that does all the statistics to find out what the alternative variant calls and so on. Okay, so results. Um, these are four cell lines that we ran together, and I highlighted uh, three positions. And these three positions are all in the same cell line. Um, I've, we've mixed just all of the, the four cell lines, all of the variant calls that are in there. So you have them going from the, the beginning of the mitochondrial sequence all the way to the end. And what you can see is that I have at position 12, 17, a variant. And then for the same DNA sample at positions 15, 490 and 15, 9, 961, uh, alternative va variant positions with different frequencies. So these frequencies are, 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 are sort of in, in a way that, that might make you believe that there might be a uh, phase inside these samples. Now, when you look at this on the level of Illumina, there is no way that you can actually assign 
uh, haplotypes out of the Illumina reads that you would get on this because the, the, the two alternative alleles are, are basically too far apart. So what you can now do with the, with the nanopore sequencing is you can figure out which allele at which where in position actually belongs together. In this case, we have three haplotypes that are spanned by these, uh, these three polymorphic positions, and we can say exactly what the frequency of those individual haplotypes are out of this. Um, and here I have a, a, a set of clinical samples. I have 14 samples, and what I want to point you to is, I think, the fifth line, which is AW6500. Uh, that has a heteroplasmy that we were able to detect at 0.2%. So this is two molecules out of 1,000 that are in an alternative uh, configuration to the, to the wild-type uh, sequence in this particular sample. So we are able to detect down to that level. Okay, um, so we had one extra sample. For that sample, it was unclear what was going on. It was clear from the, 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 gen the, the quality control that is done by gel electrophoresis that something really odd is happening. There are multiple deletions in this particular mitochondrial DNA. So the way this is done is you carry out a long-range PCR that you go from position 2000 in the two directions, amplify the 16.6 kb fragment, put it on the gel, and then see <coughs> things. And what we can see in this case here is that there are multiple shorter fragments, but it's not clear how many there are and what they look like. And so what we've plotted on the left-hand side is the long-range PCR fed into an Illumina protocol. So it's, it's prepared, a library made, short reads, sequenced, and then aligned up to the mitochondrial sequence. And what you can see is, is, is very uneven coverage, which is obviously a huge problem because you can't quantify anyf anything out of this. And you see a place on the left-hand side of that where there is a huge gap, so a lot of stuff missing. So we then took the long-range PCR product itself and put that through the nanopore. And what you can see on the right-hand side is the long-range PCR product going through the nanopore. However, what is important here is that long-range PCR has a huge bias in it. So shorter fragments tend to amplify better, so you see more of those. So you see a short fragment that is going from 16,000 to 3,000 that is, that is present at a, at a very high abundance. You see a second product that is going from roughly 14,000 to 11,000. That one is less abundant according to this, and then there is a gap between 11 and 14 where you see nothing. However, when we do this with the Cas9, we do the following. We put the Cas9 cut in the position very close to where the PCR primers are, and you see three populations in this. So in the left side, you see three populations, one of them at very, very low frequency, something like, like 8%, uh, going from 16 to 3. Then a second population where a bit is missing from 11 to 14. And you see in the gap between 11 and 14, you see some residual full-length sequence. So there is mitochondrial uh, genome sequences that is there, but it's very little. So there's 10% or so that is, that is full length, 10% that, that has a long deletion and about 80% that has a short deletion. If you put the cut in a different place, so you put it in one, of the, in one of the gaps, then you suddenly only see two species, which is what you see on the middle circus plot. And if you put the cut in the position where, where, where you have both deletions operating, you see a single species, which is what you have on the right. So you can pick this apart very nicely doing that. Okay, so in summary, um, I, sh I showed you a method that you can use for multiplexing. You don't need extra barcoding. You can throw many, many things together. That makes it cost effective. We get full length, full length single molecule mitochondrial genome sequences. We have developed a pipeline that uh, that is very, very effective. We run the entire pipeline past the guppy on, on a regular commodity computer that probably many of you are carrying around here, runs in a couple of seconds. Um, we have reliable detection of heteroplasmy below 1%. Um, we can quantify multiple deletions very, very accurately, and we can solve haplotypes. So we can get haplotypes totally measured across the mitochondrial genome.
And with that, I think uh, Nanopo asked me to put up this slide here, just as a disclaimer. That's I'm happy to do. And then the final slide is uh, this one here, the acknowledgements. Uh, this has been the work of many, many very competent people. I want to highlight Yeva and Simon, Simon who wrote the software, Marta who drove this thing to, to this level of uh, completion, and Philip Becker who, uh, who, uh, who started out doing this for us. Okay, with that, I thank you all for your attention. <laughs>